We are a very data-rich organisation, so we've recorded every performance at a parkrun since the very first parkrun back in 2004. So we can we can uh, get some get some great insight from the data. We can show the impacts that we're having, uh, so that when we're talking to a commercial partner or, or government, we can really clearly show that for the investment that you uh, may put into us, that these are the outcomes that we can deliver and we know that because we've done it before and we can show you the trends. So we can show that uh, when an event starts in an area, that this is the impact on that area and these are the, the benefits it will bring to that community. You're listening to episode 228 of the Fitness Business Podcast. We'd like to thank this month's premier podcast partner, Tribe Team Training. Tribe Team Training are the world-class leaders in small group training experiences. Earn unprecedented profit, gain guaranteed results for your members, and ensure the very best small group training education for your coaches. Contact Tribe Team Training today and have a conversation to see just how much opportunity there is at your fitness facility. Go to tribeteamtraining.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Hi, everyone, and a very warm welcome to this week's show. Today, I'm joined by Tim Oberg, the founder and CEO of Parkrun Australia. Parkrun is the largest participation event in Australia, and it operates in over 350 communities with 750,000 members. What is particularly special about Parkrun is that it's one of the largest providers of volunteer opportunities, with over 3,000 people giving their time every single weekend. I invited Tim to join us on the show to chat about how the Parkrun initiative began. We also talk about how they've been able to maintain a volunteer-based event every single week since launch. He shares some tips on how to approach sponsors for an event and last but not least, we chat about and Tim shares some advice on starting a volunteer-led activity in your own community. Now, before we hear from Tim, I first want to say a big thank you to our podcast partner, Tribe Team Training. Tribe Team Training spends every minute of every day specializing and developing the very best team training experiences available for your club, coaches, and members. Find out more at tribeteamtraining.com or click on the link in today's show notes. Enjoy this week's show with my special guest, Tim Oberg. Tim, a very warm welcome and thanks for joining us on the show today. Thanks for having me, Chantal. So give us a little bit of background about Parkrun. Tell us how long has the initiative actually been going for and what was that initial motivation to launch Parkrun? Sure. So Parkrun started in the UK back in 2004. Uh, I'm not the founder. The founder is uh, Paul Sinton Hewitt, who's uh, become a good friend of mine over the years, but Paul's the founder. And Paul came from uh, a pretty competitive running background. Uh, he's a sub, sub three hour marathon runner, so pretty, pretty quick. Uh, and he got, he got injured. He actually, it's a funny story. He was running with his dogs and he tripped over one of his dogs uh, while he was running. And off the back of that, did a number of serious injuries to his body uh, and was told he was going to have to have a, an extended break from running. And, and what, what was really uh, difficult about, about that for Paul was not so much away from the running, but away from all his friends at the running club. Uh, and so Paul, uh, I guess when he was convalescing, uh, had this idea that if he, if he couldn't go to the runners and, and his mates at the running club, he would bring them to him uh, by creating a, a free five kilometre or 3.1 mile uh, time trial. It would happen every week. It would be in the same place at the same time. And the one proviso was that if, if, uh, if he was going to put that on for them, they had to do something for him, which was they all had to go for coffee afterward. So, Tim, when did you get involved and bring Parkrun to Australia? 
so I, I reached out to Parkrun uh, through the website. I, I was already planning on, on moving back to Australia. As I say, I've been in the UK for almost 10 years. And I, was, and I spoke to Paul. Paul and I met and went for a, a cup of coffee. So the coffee comes into it again. Uh, and and we, we had a good chat and, and basically the timing was right. I was kind of like the right person uh, at the right time uh, having that meeting with Paul. And, you know, it's completely changed my life because I, I moved back to Australia with my wife the following year. Uh, we started the first park run on the Gold Coast in 2011. Uh, and I never thought it was going to become a career or a job or a business. It was really something that I thought I'll do that. As it'll be fun. It'll be a great way to meet new people and, and grow my professional network. But, uh, you know, as fate would have it, it's, um, you know, it's really evolved into something pretty special. Tim, one of the things that I read that you had written about Parkrun is that in order to thrive and grow, we rely on the grassroots support from the community, both in terms of volunteering and participation. I'd like to talk more about the role of the volunteers. Give us an insight into how they contribute to Parkrun and just how important they are to the overall initiative. Sure. Well, uh, you know, Paul, who I mentioned before, he was the very first parkrun volunteer and, you know, he, he had this idea he was going to put on a parkrun event for his friends uh, and that he would volunteer, uh, and that he would round up a few, uh, a few like-minded people, i.e. friends and family, who would help him do that and put this event on. And really, it's, that's still how it works. If, if a person wants to set up a parkrun event in their community, uh, they, they contact us and, and then they become sort of lead volunteer or, or we call them the event director uh, and they bring Parkrun to that location. And it, and it still is, uh, most of the time, it still is that they rope in their, their uh, husband or their wife or their, their girlfriend or boyfriend and, and, and uh, you know, their neighbour and, and whoever else. And, you know, they, they tend to be the, the sort of founding volunteers that get an, get an event um, up and up and running, literally, um, and and yeah, as, I, as you said in the quote, they literally are uh, the foundation or the life, the life blood of, of Parkrun. And and to give you an idea, um, on the on the Saturday that we we've, we've just had, uh, we had over so we had twenty seven thousand five hundred and two people globally volunteer at at, at a Parkrun event. We had one thousand seven hundred thirty six Parkrun locations operated on the on the on the weekend just gone. Um, and yeah, over uh, over so it, over two thousand people volunteered for the first time as well. So it's it's an incredible amount of uh, of people who are giving their time. Uh, and we would, uh, as much as people like to, to focus on the number of people who actually come to park run and run and walk and and I guess all the benefits that come with that. I think the the numbers that actually make me more proud are the volunteering numbers because I think this is just so unique to what we do. I mean, it's there are a lot of you know, participation events out there and participation initiatives, but very few of them are underpinned by this huge community of volunteers. Thank you so much for for diving into that and exploring that with us in regards to the volunteers, Tim. Now, you are a not-for-profit organisation, but obviously there's a, a financial model to the business and you mentioned you've got a team. Help us understand that. Do you have sponsors? Is that where the finances come for the business? Yeah, absolutely. So, so when Parkrun started, and I mentioned I met, I met Paul, and we agreed I was going to bring Parkrun here. Uh, well, there there were no sponsors. It was uh, you know that was a, a part of my job was if if I, we wanted to see Parkrun grow, we needed to create a, a financial model that would secure uh, the organisation and, and and facilitate growth. So, so there was so it wasn't a job for me at first because there was no money at all. You know, in in the organisation, I actually you know paid paid for the equipment, the initial equipment myself. But we got really lucky, and and you know a lot of lot of these stories involve a bit of luck, don't they? And and when I, when I left the UK to come back to Australia, I had a month in South Africa on the way, and as I was getting married to my wife, who's from Cape Town, or my now wife, who's from Cape Town, uh, and when I was there, I was talking with her brother, and his best friend just happened to work for Adidas in Cape Town, uh, and then I was talking to him, and he he 
happened to know the guys from Adidas in Melbourne. Uh, so he introduced me to them. And then, and then when I did get back to Australia, um, I think we'd already set up the first parkrun event, which was in April, but I, I then flew down uh, to Melbourne and had a meeting with, with Adidas Australia. And, and they were just, they just happened to be looking for something at the time to, to sponsor that was in running and was in participation. Um, and so, yeah, we got really lucky and then Adidas came on board uh, in the first year with us here. And uh, they were, uh, they were uh, our, our major partner for the first three years that we existed. Uh, so fast forward to where we are now, uh, and we have uh, Medibank, who are a private health insurance uh, company. They're our major partner. Also, the Athletes Foot, who are a running retailer. And we've got another uh, a number of other conversations that are that are happening at the moment as well, too, that are in that sort of commercial sponsorship space. Um, outside of that, though, there's also uh, revenue through working with various levels of, of government. And here in Australia, we have our, our federal government, but then each state also has a a government and then each uh, sort of local area or local council has a government as well and they tend to all have various types of grant funding or or similar available so at the moment you know we actually do work with all three levels of government across the country um, we were successful uh, earlier this year in a, a 1.8 million dollar grant federal government, the, the Sport Australia and the, the uh, Department of Sport and that was easily the, the most significant uh, government uh, uh, grant that we've that, that we've ever received um, so that's that's all about to kick in and that's that's for a specific project around uh, getting over 65s engaged with park run they call it the better aging grant um, so so look there's a, as I say there's a number of uh, revenue streams we've also got a merchandise model and a few other bits and pieces around the track but yeah it, look it, it, when when we started there was nothing we had to, we had to create something uh, in terms of in terms of the finances and every park run country works the same uh, we you know we to, in order to secure the future we need to look at getting that commercial support and government support so uh, in some countries it's more challenging than others some countries that we operate in have quite dysfunctional governments uh, so it's not not as easy to to get the government money uh, so I won't, I won't name names of those countries, but um, yeah, look, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, but look, it's a real challenge because the size we're at now, um, I've now got 10 staff uh, in Australia and we oversee Australia and we also have operations in Malaysia, Singapore and soon to be Japan. Uh, so there's a lot of people who rely on what we do and, and depend on what we do to have their sort of Saturday park run fix and also from my position as CEO, you know, I've got to pay pay wages. So we need to make sure that, that you know the money the money is coming in. So um, so Kelly Kelly May is, is our CFO. If she's listening to this, Kelly, thank you for everything you do to keep our books balanced. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, I know that a lot of people will be listening and they'll be very motivated by your story and the fact that you really have built this business from, you know, as you say initially you were volunteering yourself. So for mm -hmm. our listeners out there that are thinking that they'd like to start a volunteer-based initiative or an initiative, a, a physical-based initiative in their local community, uh, what advice would you give to them about or tips would you give to them for them approaching sponsors, uh, mm -hmm. whether they be local businesses or big-name brands like you have? Is there any advice or tips that you would share with them around that? Yeah, look, it's really, really tricky and challenging. It's one of it's one of the most difficult parts of the job. It, it is, I, I guess, exactly what you said: approaching sponsors, asking for money, approaching the government, asking for money, because everyone wants something different uh, when when you do go and approach them. I, I think one of the keys to our success and, and our ability to go and have those conversations, whether it's with a local sponsor. Uh, because we're just looking at a, a, a local park run event and, and, you know, we have had that in the past. We've had little local businesses that have sponsored just their local park run event. We, we don't do that anymore, but we have done that. So we're, so, we're, so whether we're looking at a little local business or whether look, we're looking at uh, a, a multinational company or whether we're talking about the federal government or local council, is that we, we are a very data-rich organisation. So we've recorded every performance at a park run since the very first park run back in 2004. So we can, we can uh, get some 
get some great insight from the data. We can show the impacts that we're having uh, so that when we're talking to a commercial partner or, or government, we can really clearly show that for the investment that you may put into us, that these are the outcomes that we can deliver and we know that because we've done it before and we can show you the trends. So we can show that uh, when an event starts in an area, that this is the impact on that area and these are the, the benefits it will bring to that community. So so in terms of tips for, for other people, I'd say make sure that you are recording the, the data that is unique to what you do so that you can really tell your story um, and, and don't just think about telling your story in six weeks' time. You know, we're talking about being able to tell your story over a number of years so that you can show impact. And I think, you know, this is something that, as I say, we, we, we do well uh, at, at Parkrun and I think it's quite unique to what we do. But it's only because Paul, the founder, he, he was, a, he was a, a guy who was just big on spreadsheets. Uh, you know, right, he was right into recording all the info, recording all the data uh, and all, all his friends who helped him out were also right into that. So they built databases right from the start that recorded everything and were able to you know manage that so we've now got this incredible history and, and legacy of, of data and, uh, and, and information within Parkrun. I noticed also Tim that you showcase a lot of that data on the home page of the website as well so mm-hmm. people that are uh, new to Parkrun and they're jumping onto the website to have a look they can see all of that for themselves and I, I have to say from a consumer perspective just seeing that level of participation, it kind of gives the consumer a sense of reassurance that they're part of a huge community and they're part of a movement uh, which is is beyond even their local community. So congratulations on on the kind of lengths that you go to to collect that data and, and how you have embraced that both from the business point of view but also and a consumer point of view, but also when it comes to recruiting your sponsors and, and your government support. Uh, I wanted to find out a little bit more about how you actually spread the word about Parkrun because this is a major area that, you know, can be challenging sometimes and that is you, you come up with this great initiative and, you know, half a dozen people like it, but how do you actually grow beyond that first half a dozen people? And you mentioned that your first involvement came about because someone, you know, it was word of mouth. Someone said to you, hey, did you hear about the run? But these days, what are your promotional methods for, you know, getting the word out about the events? Yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely evolved in time how, how we do that. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, when Paul started the very first park run, there was never an intention that there was going to be an event two and three and four and five. Uh, but that really came out from grassroots demand. It was it was people who'd been to to the original park run in Bushy Park, and but it might have been too far away from them to go regularly. And they said, well, look, we, we want one. So there was no marketing as such. It was just uh, grassroots demand from people who had, had been. Uh, and they said, you know, we want one for ourselves. Now, if I fast forward to where we are now, uh, and I, I mentioned again, I mentioned before that we're just about to launch into Japan uh, and, and we're going into J- the, the Japan launch with a, a bit of a different agenda. It's uh, The agenda is not so much about uh, just organic growth, but rather we really want to see, see um, to, I guess, a, the parkrun concept grow as quickly as we can make that grow in Japan. So... Uh, so we've gone out there with a, a pretty strong social media campaign. So we've got uh, just all, the, all, all of what you would expect in terms of, you know, fa- Facebook and Instagram. And, and in Japan, they use uh, Line, um, which is a, a very popular um, uh, form of social media in, in, in Japan. And we're not just talking about, uh, I guess, like, for example, with Facebook, we're not just, we don't just have Facebook pages for our first event, which launches in a couple of weeks. But we're, we, we do, we're, I guess what we're doing is, is prospecting on Facebook. So I've set up a number of, I think I've set up about a dozen uh, pages uh, for potential park run events in the most populous c- uh, cities in Japan. So uh, sort of you know, Osaka and Kawasaki and Yokohama and all, and all these other places that are outside of Tokyo yeah, because we're launching in Tokyo. So we've, we've had everything translated into Japanese and, and these pages are all basically saying, hey, you, if you've heard about park run but it's not in your city yet, 
get in touch and, and, and we will then show you how to set up a park run in, in your community. So we're quite proactively out there. Uh, I guess fishing might be the way you would describe it, uh, fishing for people to, to start park run events there. So on the whole, if you look at the history of park run, it's been very much word of mouth. But yeah, as we grow strategically, then we'll be looking at, um, uh, I guess, being much more proactive in terms of how we grow. Tim, as we briefly discussed earlier, we recently had Dr. Fiona Bull from the World Health Organization come onto the show. And one of the things she spoke about was the Global Action Plan for Physical Activity. Now, we are expecting across the world that there's going to be a lot of fitness professionals who want to jump on board and they want to start to uh, implement some initiatives in their own communities. So based on your experience, could you share some advice with all of the fit pros out there who would want to start a volunteer-led physical activity initiative? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that most important thing uh, about Parkrun is that there's a, there's a role or, or an opportunity for everybody to engage with Parkrun in some way. So, and, and that can be whatever you want it to be. So if, if you want to engage with Parkrun as, some, as, as someone who wants to come along and run really fast, so you might be an Olympic athlete and you want to come down on Saturday morning and run a time trial and, and do it in 13 minutes or 14 minutes or 15 minutes, then that's absolutely fine. Um, there's, there's a place for you at Parkrun. You know, you register, you come on down, you run fast, run as fast as you can, and that is your Parkrun experience. Now, if you are someone who has actually no interest in running or walking or jogging or sweating, any of that, but if your interest is in simply meeting people, meeting new people and being engaged in your community, then we've got a place for you as well because you can come and volunteer. And our volunteer roles are really simple. They can be things that do involve technology. Uh, We've got a a timing app that that we use, but it can be as simple as being a marshal on the course where you simply stand there and and encourage people as they go by. And, uh, you know, high fives are pretty popular at Parkrun, so you might have a sore hand at the end of it from all the high fives. But other than that, uh, you you know, it's a very, very simple role. So, And and then, of course, everything in between. So everything between the, the elite athlete, and the, the individual that just wants to come on down and be involved, um, there, there is a, a role or a home for you at Parkrun. So in terms of you know, advice to other professionals, I'd be thinking about when you are coming up with your concept or your, or your initiative, think of the way you can get the, the most number of people engaged and how you can make it, I guess, the least threatening kind of opportunity you know you've got to break down those barriers to participation that people have and they might be barriers that that, that you don't see yeah, yeah obviously a lot of people in in fitness they they're, they're super healthy themselves and they they w- might not necessarily see all these barriers that other people who are coming from a place of inactivity uh would see so um and look you know our, our, and we've evolved uh, over time with that too and and, and with parkrun like when i when i started uh the the volunteer who, who ran the event on a Saturday was called the race director. And, and, and race director is a pretty common term you hear in, in running event circles and fun runs and, and whatnot. But we made a conscious decision early on in, in the time that I've been involved that we would take the term race out of uh, our vocabulary because the feedback we, has, we had from people was if they heard that, heard that, that that role was the race director, that meant park run was a serious race and that only runners could do it. And so that person is now called a run director. Uh, and, and then, of course, we hear from people that, that, that does that mean that you have to run? But no, it doesn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, so we've been, re- we've been really um, particular with the language that we use to make sure that language is inclusive and welcoming and, and, and will, you know, break down some of those perceived barriers. So, so I guess if you're, if you're trying to do a community uh, boot camp, you know, don't call it your hardcore body blitz or something like that because, that, you know, that, that name is just going to put people off. You know, you want to you come up with, with a name and a concept that's welcoming and uses, uses inclusive language. Um, so I think, yeah, there's probably a couple of tips in there that people could use. Tim, one last question for you. I'm intrigued to know how it is that you keep your volunteers over a long period of time, because obviously it is a volunteer role uh, and, and, you know, that's, it's a big commitment that you're asking from people. So what are some of the ways that you're able to keep them engaged within the organisation? 
We'll hear that answer from Tim in just a second, but first, here's a quick message from Medallia MXM. Member experience is more than just NPS. With MXM's Member Experience Toolkit, you build a unified view of the member experience, from purchase to onboarding to everyday usage and cancellation. Wire your entire organization with actionable feedback using MXN's Member Experience Toolkit. To find out more, go to mxmetrics.com. Now back to Tim. Yeah, that's a great question. And it's something we think about a lot, obviously, because recruitment and, and retention of volunteers is, is absolutely key to the, the parkrun model ticking over each week. And so one of the one of the things we do that's that's relatively new in terms of the, the parkrun world, we've been doing it for a few years, is that when someone volunteers 25 times, they are awarded what we call the, the V25 shirt. It's a, it's a, it's a T-shirt. It's a, it's a purple T-shirt. We actually refer to it as aubergine, <laughs> uh, but it's parkrun aubergine is the colour. But yeah, no, they're, they're awarded a volunteering T-shirt that they wear proudly when they come along. So that's a, I guess that's a, a physical, tangible um, reward that, that we, we give volunteers after 25 volunteering stints. Um, to be honest, though, I think that most people come back for the intrinsic rewards that they feel. I think when people volunteer at Parkrun, it makes them feel connected to their community. Uh, I think they can see the benefits that, that, that people are getting uh, and that they feel the benefits themselves. You know, we, we, we never present volunteering as, as that you are, you're missing out your, on your run, so come and volunteer. Yeah, we promote volunteering as something that is positive in itself. It's uh, positive and unique and that the benefits of volunteering are equal to, if not better, than what you get out of running or walking at Parkrun. Um, and so, I, you know, I mentioned language just before and, and certainly in the way we talk about volunteering, we, we never talk about giving up your time because that makes it sound like a sacrifice, doesn't it? But we talk about giving your time because, because you are, you're, you're giving your time to your community. Um, and so, we, you know, we're, we're, we're very particular about that. But then even other little things uh, in terms of the way our, um, our, our results processing system works. So when we process the results and we, we sort of uh, confirm our volunteering rosters because we've got a volunteering uh, system that we use online for scheduling things, everyone gets an automatic thank you uh, so there's just a little pat on the back there from Parkrun saying thanks for volunteering. Uh, and everybody who volunteers gets their name listed on the, uh, on the website. And, again, this all happens automatically, but it is another little pat on the, pat on the back. Um, and I do, I do uh, when, I, when I speak in front of groups of sport administrators and things like that, one of the questions I often ask them when I, when I uh, talk about volunteering is how many of you actually thank your volunteers by name? at the end of the day, you know, do you, do you go up and actually thank each one and pat them on the back or do you acknowledge them or do you just take them for granted? And, and I think it's, you know, there's lots of little things you can do that, you know, some of these we've built in that are automated into our system uh, and then others uh, are a bit more, um, you know, strategic such as the shirt. But, um, yeah, I, I just think it's, it's something that's, that's evolved over time with us and it, is, and it is something that I think a lot of organisations probably miss out on and probably could do a bit better on it. You know, that's not to say that we're perfect at all. But, um, you know, I do, do, when, I, when, when I do pose those questions to sports club managers and administrators and so on, they, they're very often <laughs> shaking their head at me saying that, no, that isn't actually something we do and we should. So, um, but overall, look, I think the, the key is we make volunteering fun. You know, we, we, we keep it interesting, we keep it fun, all the roles are easy and it's also over and done with very quickly. I mean, a, a typical parkrun event from when the first volunteer gets there to, to when the event's over is probably 90 minutes. So we're not asking for huge chunks of people's day. It's short and sharp, it's fun, it's social uh, and you all end up in the cafe with everyone at the end anyway. So, yeah, I think that's, that's how we do it. Tim, it's great to hear how the business has evolved over time and the things that you've learned along the way. And, and we're very grateful for you sharing so many of those lessons with us today. So for everyone that's listening and they want to know more about Parkrun or perhaps they want to start a Parkrun in their own community, where is the best place for them to find out more information? 
Well, as you'd imagine, it's parkrun.com uh, and then that's our, that's our global website and there's plenty of information and, and stats and, and nice pictures on the, on the website but ultimately from there you can click on uh, your country page. So whichever, you know, whichever country you're, you're listening in right now or, or you live in, uh, you, can, you can click on, on, on that one there. And, and I know you mentioned uh, a lot of your listeners to, uh, to, to this podcast are in North America, and we've got a, we've got a growing a, a growing community there, and we, we would certainly love to see more park runs springing up around the US and Canada and so on. So, uh, yeah, definitely encourage people to check it out and get involved. Fantastic. Well, that sounds like a great idea, and I would love to hear about anyone that jumps on and, and does get involved in park run uh, anywhere at all around the world. And Tim, thank you so much for taking the time and telling us about this wonderful initiative and it feels like the timing is absolutely perfect with the whole world really working together to get more people more physically active so thank you so much for taking the time to join us on the show today absolute pleasure thanks for having me team rockstar fit is an award-winning mastermind team that helps fit pros lead happy and balanced lives get mentoring and support learn how to grow your business online with beachbody You can apply for a free consultation today at teamrockstarfit.com. Precore Quickfire 5. This week we have not one, but two Precore Quickfire 5 guests. And that's because next week we have two guests joining us on the show to share their experience as a club manager. So this week, our first pre call Quick Five Five guest is Mandy Holden, the club manager for Anytime Fitness North Reno. I'm really excited to welcome our special guest for today. Mandy, welcome. Thank you for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. It's so exciting. <laughs> it's so exciting to have you on. Now, start off by telling everyone, why do you do what you do? I do what I do because I would like everybody I meet, get to experience uh, the kind of magic fitness can have on your life. So I get passionate about that. And what's one ritual that helps you become better at what you do? Um, The affirmations that I set for myself, practicing um, really, really setting intentions for myself and using affirmations are something I can't live without. Oh, beautiful. Do you do that in the morning or in the night? It's obviously a bit of a ritual for you. I do it every morning. Every morning. That's beautiful. And are there any apps or systems that you use to stay in control of your workload? I would say, I mean, we have a bunch of resources that we get to use within our brand that keep, that keep everything really organized. But for myself personally, I would not be able to function without my iPhone. (laughs) (laughs) You and me both. I'm sure there's lots of people that can uh, relate to that. And are there any books, podcasts, or blogs that you would recommend and why? Yes. I'm so glad you asked. I'm obsessed with Cy Wakeman. She has a podcast that's called, I mean, besides fitness business podcast. Well, thank you. <laughs> um, but Cy Wakeman does a podcast called No Ego Podcast. It's a leadership podcast and I adore her and I'm obsessed with that podcast right now. It's so much good um, leadership wisdom in there. So I recommend it to everyone. Okay. How do, how do I spell her name? It's going to be C-Y. Mm-hmm. And the last name is W-A-K-E-M-A-N. Okay, thank you so much. I haven't heard of that one before, so we'll make sure that we grab the link and pop it in the show notes for everyone. And Mandy, to finish off with today, just give everyone a quick overview of the topic that we're going to be focusing on during your main interview. Um, Well, my favorite thing that I'm really passionate about is team building. And um, I think that it's been a high performance work culture on our team has made all the difference. So that's what I'd like to focus on. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us. I'm really excited to talk to you in the main interview next week and share a bit of background about your story and obviously dive into uh, your shoes as the club manager of Anytime Fitness. So Mandy, thank you for joining me today for the pre-call Quick Fire Five. Thank you. MyZone is a wearable technology platform that leverages personal goal setting, gamification, and social platforms to motivate your members. To find out more, go to myzone.org. And my second pre call Quick Fire 5 guest this week is Shay Hill. Shay is the programs manager for Coburn ARC and the owner of Genesis Fitness in Parramatta, Australia. Shay, welcome along. It is so great to have you on the show today. 
Absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Chantal. Let's start things off with a pre call quick fire five and tell us why do you do what you do? Um, I love making a difference in other people's lives. That's pretty much the only reason I do what I do. And what's one ritual that helps you become better at what you do? I start with the hardest things first, always, <laughs> every day. The hardest jobs are the first ones I do. And are there any apps, systems that you use to stay in control of your workload? Um, my wife says I've got a memory like a sieve and I would agree with her. So um, MS Outlook is my, my Bible and every single thing that I do each day goes in there to remind me what I need to be doing and where. Great one. And are there any books, podcasts or blogs that, that well, you would recommend and why? Probably recommended by a lot of people, but Gary Vaynerchuk's podcast is my personal favourite. Absolutely fantastic. His nuggets of, of business wisdom that are real um, and executable, absolutely love. A very popular choice, that's for sure. And tell everyone just briefly what the topic is that we'll be focusing on during your main interview. A day in the life of a club manager. Excellent. Well, I'm really excited to dive into that with you, Shay. So thank you for joining us today for the pre-call Quick Fire Five. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone for joining me for this week's show. Quick reminder that, of course, you can grab all of the links and the resources for today's episode at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Also, a big thank you to our foundation partner, Active Management. As a listener of the show, you have a special opportunity to work with JT, and that means that you can get one free session when you buy one coaching session. No matter where you are in the world, technology allows him to work with you. All you need to do is go to activemgmt.com.au forward slash FBP family, and you can work with JT to get more people moving and moving more often. So one more time, that is one free coaching session when you buy one coaching session and it is exclusive to you, the FBP family. One more time, go to activemgmt.com.au forward slash FBP family. Thank you all so much once again for joining me today. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Mm-hmm.